Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. The first order of business this evening is to administer the Oath of Allegiance to the newly elected Board of Education members and the Superintendent of Schools. As I call your name, please come to the middle of the stage to take your oath. Dr. Tice. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of New York and the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge and that I will faithfully discharge according to the best of my ability according to the best of my ability the duties of the Office of Superintendent of the Faithful Manlius Central School District. The duties of the office of the position of superintendent of the Fayetteville Manlius Central School District. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Ms. Lindars. Please raise your right hand. Thank you. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. The duties of the Office of Board of Education member. The duties of the Office of Board of Education member. Of the Fateful Manly Central School District. Of the Fateful Manly Central School District. Congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Mims, please. Sorry. Please raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of New York and the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability, the duties of the Office of Board of Education member. The duties of the Office of Board of Education member of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Congratulations. Thank you, Sarah. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. The duties of the Office of Board of Education member. The duties of the Office of Board of Education. Of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Congratulations. Thank you. The next order of business is the nomination and election of the President of the Board of Education. Is there a nomination for the position of President of the Board of Education? Yes, Ms. Wheeler? I would like to nominate Ms. Marissa Mims. I will second that. 
Are there any other nominations? I need a motion to close nominations and to cast a vote for Marissa Joy Mims as president of the Board of Education. Do we have a motion? Thank you, Ms. Lindars, and a second. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? We have five, at least five votes. Congratulations, President Mims. Next order of business is a nomination and election of the Vice President of the Board of Education. Is there a nomination for the position of Vice President of the Board of Education? I would like to nominate Sharon Lindars for Vice President of the Board of Education. Thank you, Kelly. I'll second that nomination. Thank you. Are there any additional nominations? I need a motion to close nominations and to cast a vote for Sherry Lindars as Vice President of the Board of Education. Thank you, Daryl. Second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Oh, wait. All in favor of Sherry Lindars as Vice President of the Board of Education, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. All right. Uh, let's have five all. So we have five votes, actually nine. So congratulations, Ms. Lindar. Thank you. Next, we will have the administration of the Oath of Allegiance to the Board President and the Vice President. Once again, I'll ask you to come to the center of the, uh, of the stage. Okay. Please raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. The duties of the Office of President. The duties of the Office of President. Of the Board of Education. Of the Board of Education. Of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Congratulations. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States of America. That I will support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the State of New York and the Constitution of the State of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. The duties of the Office of Vice President. The duties of the Office of Vice President. Of the Board of Education. Of the Board of Education. Of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District. Congratulations. Thank you. Next on the agenda, item 3.01, availability of a district safety plan. The 2021-22 district safety plan and CSIRO SPO agreements are available for review. The public hearing and adoption of the safety plan and CSIRO SPO agreements will occur at a future meeting. Just, I just have a quick question on mm -hmm. that when I was going through them. Um, for some reason, it's numbered page one through 37, then one through 32, then one through 33, which just made it really difficult to find sections with it. Is there a specific reason why it's split up like that? Or can we just do it as a consistent with a master? We can index? do it as consistent or it probably was the appendices. So I will double check on that. Thank you. Any additional questions or discussion? Okay. Item 3.02, approval or revision of the agenda for this evening. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District hereby approve the agenda as presented? Thank you, Kelly, and a second from Sherry. Any discussion? 
All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next item on the agenda, item 3.03, .03, is public comment. We have a number of people here for public comment this evening. I would ask that you try to please keep your um, public comment two, three minutes. I do have um, signs to let you know when your time is running out. Um, please refrain from any specific mention of staff members, teachers, or students um, within the district, even if it's your own child. Um, I would ask that the audience be respectful of the board meeting during public comment and refrain from any loud cheering or clapping during public comment. I will call each individual up to the podium so that they can give their public comment. The board does not always respond during public comment, but if you have a specific question, we will get back to you. So first for public comment, Tony Prince. Mr. Prince, at the podium, on your microphone, there is a button that looks like a person. If you hit that button, your mic will light up red. There you go. Good evening. I'm Tony Prince. I'm a taxpayer and parent. Last time I spoke here, I said that racism had no place in the FM school district. I stand firmly with that. The board seems to listen to one group of people and implement their wants while not doing the same for others. We the concerned parents and taxpayers want a say. We the taxpayers are the ones paying for all the chairs you're sitting in right now. We and our children are the stakeholders, not you, the board or teachers. After the last meeting, I wrote an email to the board and Craig Tice asking specific questions. These questions were designed to keep them honest and transparent. The response I received was nothing but that. Marissa only answered some of the questions. Why is that? Could it be the other questions could expose much more information than they wish not to share? To that end, I feel the board and Craig Tice are not being honest and transparent. Like so many, I've always trusted the staff and never really dug into what was going on in our schools. As a parent, I watched some of the Zoom remote learning sessions and could not believe what I was watching. Teachers with a political and social agenda and a union to protect them. Now we are about to have another social agenda being implemented by the board and school boards across all of America all fueled by federal money sent to state and local levels related to a COVID-19 bill. There are many states that have banned critical race theory as they know how dangerous it can be uh, and the div division it creates. Make no mistake, diversity, equity, and inclusion is critical race theory. Marissa Mims said that at the last meeting that they were not the same and the district had no plans for criti critical race theory. Well, over the weekend, the NEA, which is the nation's largest teachers union, said that critical race theory is reasonable and appropriate for kids. They specifically named critical race theory. You could have looked that up in business item 39 on the NEA site up until today when they scrubbed the site. There's been news coverage about this all day. Maybe not on all news networks, but it's been all day. So gee, I wonder why. The union even said that they're willing to fight anyone opposed to critical race theory. More than 5,000 teachers in the union have signed a petition saying that they are willing to break any laws that crack down on teaching a critical race theory. I teach my kids to love all and look at the content of their character, not the color of one's skin. There's a reason our, reason our kids get along. It's because they don't look at how, they don't look at race as how one is defined. I say our children, I say teach our children reading, writing, and arithmetic, science, and all the normal studies that you, you teach them. Let the parents teach our children values. 
You will not tell our children that they are inferior, oppressed, privileged, or victims based on race. We should never de see discrimination against anyone by way of class, race, religion, or sex. When you are distributing books by an author that advocates discrimination and then insert critical thought about races in the curriculum, you as a body are at risk at many levels. Part, part of Marissa Mims' response when I asked about the book written by someone that advocates discrimination and distributed to the board and administrative staff was, I recently recognized it was recently recognized as a New York Times bestseller for the week of June 6, 2020. Really? In my view, the board is not truthful and only cares about their own agenda and anyone that agrees with them. Thanks so much. I'm going to again ask that you refrain from doing that. Public comment is optional for the board. We do want to give people the opportunity to speak, but this is a business meeting, so please refrain from all the clapping. I'm not taking questions, sir. Can you turn the volume up on all the microphones? We're having trouble hearing you. Okay. I don't know if you got that. There we go. Thank you. All right. Next, we will have Mr. James Holmes. Thank you for taking your oath to the U.S. Constitution today. I'm sure that was difficult for some of you, seeing how you're actively trying to tear it down. But I say this not to the board because I feel as it falls on deaf ears. I say this to my friends, my family, my neighbors, and my children. We live in the greatest country in the world, founded on the premise that all men are created equal. I say this because I have experienced other countries and other cultures. I have fought and I've had friends that have fought and died for this country. Throughout history, each generation continues to build on this and make our union a more perfect one. We cannot, nor should we ever forget the ills of the past and those who have come before us. Nor should we blame future generations for these ills. Today, these beliefs are being challenged in our schools. I do not support a district that is not transparent and fundamentally shifts away from education and towards indoctrination of our children under the guise of diversity, equality, and inclusion. I believe diversity, equality, and inclusion make our society better and stronger when all perspectives are heard. Yet I cannot support an author who calls white people who adopt black children white colonizers. Yet this is the same author the district is rallying behind for diversity. What about Dr. Carol Swan, Dr. Wilfred Riley, or Vivek Ramswamy, among other conservative viewpoints? Should have those voices be heard to enhance the conversation and understanding? The guidance from the state asks schools to empower students as agents of social change. What will be FM's target groups of social change? All groups are just those leaning to one political side or narrative. How are we going to address equality when members in our own community who support this DEI initiative think it's acceptable to tell those that disagree, well, you know, just send your kid to a private school or homeschool them. Talk about a sense of entitlement. How equitable was it for working families when school was open for kids two days a week when the science did not support this decision? Per New York State Department of Education Department and Diver on diversity, equality, and inclusion call to action, it states, all students must feel they are welcome, they belong, and are supported in every school. How is this different from our current code of conduct? Have we failed? DEI also addresses workforce diversity. How will FM achieve this goal? Will we redistrict other, with other schools? Will teachers and board members step down to create a more diverse workforce? I asked you that last month, and I can see by your commitment, you're all still here. Or will kids be bused to other schools to achieve a different perspective? 
As my friend said, I'm sure you're aware that the NEA, National Education Association that represents teacher unions, just voted to ensure that critical race theory is not in our, taught in our classrooms. Again, board member Mim stated last month that the school and DEI initiative is not critical race theory and critical race theory will not be taught in our classrooms. I hope you stay true to your word as you do your oath to the constitution of this country and New York. Perhaps given the impact of last year, we should go back to focusing on academics and children's emotional well-being, and leave the values for families to instill at home. I'm sorry, who is the individual who continues to whistle despite me asking you not to do it? Would you mind, would you mind stopping doing that? I've been very respectful. We're listening to everyone. We're giving everyone extended amounts of time. Please stop doing that. No, this is not the place for that, okay? I'm just asking you to stop the whistling. Thank you. Next, we will have, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your last name, uh, Lily Zhang, is it? Did I say the last name correctly? Please correct me if I didn't I have a feeling I mispronounced it and I apologize. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, first, I, I am very happy uh, to have this opportunity to express uh, my deep appreciation for the school. Uh, during the last year, it's so hard for everyone. And then the teacher has to uh, spend the double effort or triple effort to teach kids over the internet, uh, over uh, the in-person. You know, so I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, the school, thanks the teacher, thanks, thanks the district to support our kids. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, so my voice must, my voice must uh, sound very weird because I was strong accent. I'm an immigrant from a communist country. And uh, I'm uh, very thankful I have this opportunity and the freedom uh, to publicly speak my voice, my opinion, which I had never enjoyed before in the communist country. So this is a great opportunity for me uh, to, um, to express uh, myself. Uh, but, but I'm not a public speaker either. So uh, what's really special about me compared to a lot of most people here, I would think that's my past experience in communist country where we don't have the freedom. We don't have uh, uh, the uh, choice to choose we, what we like to hear, what we want to learn. So, so my topic today is that uh, uh, mainly focus on freedom and choice. I think what makes America the greatest country on earth so far is the freedom, is the constitution, that everybody is equal to make a choice, everybody is equal to make their voice to be heard. But um, based on my past year's experience, after I, my kids moved to here, I, and I talked to some parents, I really have a concern about this freedom and choice in the current culture. For example, one of the, my friends uh, I know very well, she told me that her son in the high school, uh, in a history class, when the teacher te taught the kids about how good is a communist and the socialist system, the son stand up and saying, give me an example that is there any one country that been successful to be a communist or socialist country? And the, the history teacher got so mad at the kid. And then the kid's grade was just going down the hill ever since that moment. So this is a very, very concern for me. I think no matter uh, is a teacher or is a student or a parent or maybe president of the United States, Everybody should have their right to be heard. And another example I heard from uh, the last meeting that there's a boy 
that she he's probably wearing a Trump Trump shirt on campus, and then he was titled a racist. Then when he dating a black girl as a boy as a girlfriend, the teacher told the girl that don't date this boy. He's a racist, and this is also concerns me very much because I treasure. As an immigrant from a communist country, I treasure the freedom of heat as the most um, important factor for my kids, for myself and for my kids and the, the next generation. So my point is that I have never, I, I didn't hear in my, in, in my own country, I never heard about God. And then when I came here, I went to church, I studied the Bible and I learned that there's a really true, lovely God that loves everyone, and he died for everybody's sin. But on campus now, or in academic field, God and Jesus and the, body, uh, and the Bible was taken out from everywhere. If a teacher teach the kids to pray or talk about Jesus, he or she may face the destiny to be get rid of the job. So why, why we have only one side freedom? Why we don't have the freedom to be a conservative? And then another thing about, there are so many kids has suffered from depression, hatred, lost in their life. Because we have to think about when we teach kids something on campus, we probably plant the seed of hatred. So, some facts of history will tell the kid, kids about, oh, I hate this special race. They are superiorist about at that time. But what's the solution for hatred? I think this is love. And where is love? Only God gave us the true love. And my last comment for the parents, for all the parents, who is on site and who is listening online. Teaching kids is our inherited nature responsibility. If God and uh, Jesus and the God's love is not allowed in school, do you think uh, you should uh, bring the kids to a church and give them the freedom and choice to listen what is really written in the Bible? And uh, my kids, I, to be honest, I want to share that my kids is the only teenager in, that, in, in my church. And the most of 90% or maybe 80% of the people there are seniors and they are holding uh, they are holding the environment to still let the truth out. Okay, thank you very much. Kate de la Garza. Thanks so much for the privilege to be here and speak tonight. I've spoken before in front of you. My name is Kate Delagarza. I am a queer gender nonconforming parent to two students in the district, one at Fayetteville Elementary and one at Wellwood. And I've also sent you before one of my favorite quotes um, by a man named Reinhold Niebuhr, also the author of The Serenity Prayer, which is near and dear to my heart. Love is the motive, justice, is the instrument, is the quote. I stumbled upon this in my readings of Brian Stevenson, who's the legal scholar and creator of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, which exonerates largely black men unjustly convicted of the death penalty in the South. For the last five years, my wife and I have tried to help the district understand families like ours. Every time we get a form in the mail from the district or the school that asks us to fill out mother and father. Every time an event features white heterosexual cis men crudely dressing up as women to make fun of school employees and volunteers. When my kid's first kindergarten assignment this year asked her to write about all the things she loves about her father. Not all families in FM have dads. 
We are simply asking that our experience be included here. So that's the love part. Love is the motive. Seeing the humanity of LGBTQ people, families, and youth. But to include me also means you have to include my history, my truth, honestly, my trauma. You have to tell the truth that I would not be standing here today if it weren't for largely black and brown trans people who threw bricks at police in 1969 at the Stonewall riots. I literally would not exist right now to be speaking to you. If the Supreme Court in 1986 hadn't decided Bowers versus Hardwick, which decriminalized same-sex relations in 1986, and if in 2015, they didn't allow my wife and I to marry in the eyes of the federal government. Or in 2010, when I had to adopt my own child because she did not come out of me. Being brave enough to tell the truth about marginalization in this country and ensure that it doesn't continue, that's the justice part. When Fayel asked my daughter last year to dress up as a Native American, and curate replica sacred native objects in a mock museum for her entire fourth grade class, we made the decision to leave the district. We made the decision to move away to Massachusetts where there would be more families like us, where there would be more diversity. Truthfully, we're only here because of COVID. The lack of inclusivity and the lack of anti-racism here drives people like us and people of color away from this district Grown through racial redlining, FM is as homogeneous as it is today on purpose. It is not a mistake. For me and my community, this is life-saving work. Per the New York State Dignity Act, law in this state, we are required to create an accepting atmosphere for trans youth that will hopefully reduce the 40% suicidal ideation rate. I urge you to continue the important DEI work already begun by this board. I urge you to revisit the presentation made last October by current students and alums that laid out several clear and achievable DEI goals. Please do not stop. Thank you so much. Adam Stone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening, and thank you for the work that you do. Honorable members of the school board, friends and neighbors, I come before you today a white middle-aged man. I dress in a suit because everybody takes you seriously when you wear a suit. Um, I'm the parent of an incoming kindergarten student, a former student of FM schools myself. My family has deep roots in this area. My wife and her three siblings all graduated from FM. The harms that are occurring every day to children who are unintentionally or unintentionally marginalized in our schools demand action. To move away from narratives that ignore this harm in order to avoid discomfort. An article in PNAS published in 2020, I'm a science guy, so I'm gonna quote some science, by Riddle and Sinclair shows that black students are disciplined substantially more often and more severely than white students. And that this disparity strongly correlates with implicit bias measured at the county level. Ask yourselves where we are at this county level. Imagine for a moment that you are a black student who is disciplined more often and more harshly than a white student for the same infraction, you would likely learn that your behavior will always be scrutinized at a higher level than that of your white classmates, and your opportunities in life have already been abridged. Now imagine the lesson that is being taught to your white classmates. They see you getting suspended for the same thing that they may have gotten a warning for. What conclusion can their developing minds draw from this exposure to the results of implicit bias? It does our children no favors to allow them to grow up in a cocoon 
of bias, exclusion, and privilege, when they emerge, they will either carry on believing in their bubble or see more of reality and lose trust in those that they believed. I believe that critical thinking skills and emotional intelligence should be at the forefront of education. Teaching the history of systemic racism in this country would seem an excellent way to help students develop these important tools. In addition, a student community that is more inclusive will benefit all children in it, even if their differences are not outwardly apparent. Inclusion is an effective antidote for many of the ills that plague our children, and in particular, our teenagers. I moved back to this area recently with my family from one of the most diverse cities in the country. One of my fears for us moving back here is that our daughter would grow up without a vibrant understanding of the different experiences of the people around her. This concern has run headlong into the awakening of systemic racism that has occurred since the murder of George Floyd and the calls for redress that followed. The moment that this has created has made me hopeful that even in this community, which exists in one of the most segregated metropolitan areas in the country, that we can move forward towards a common understanding of the reality of our history and toward mitigating the ongoing harms caused by systemic racism. The DI initiatives that students have demanded are a cry for relief that should not be ignored. Dr. Tice's response appears to meet some of these needs. I support both our students' demands in full and Dr. Tice's plan. I am proud of the students that came together to present to this board. Their voices should be heard and heeded. I would be very proud of our district if we do so. Thank you. Bill Braun. Hello, I am Bill Braun, parent of two school aged children in Manlius. In 1937, Japanese soldiers committed unspeakable atrocities against several hundred thousand Chinese women and children in the city of Nanking. Yet to this day, Japanese school children learn little to nothing of this. Likewise, America has much that is sordid in its past. Indigenous people were conquered and pushed um, aside to mostly impoverished land. Chinese Americans experienced heavy discrimination and for decades were excluded from citizenship. And of course, Africans captured into slavery and often treated very poorly for generations is a tragedy that all should regret. I believe schools should teach both sides of our historical facts, the good and the bad. Schools should also teach moral and political reasoning about political, uh, historical facts, but not conclusions, and especially not teach moral and political conclusions when there is some uncertainty about the facts. Not stressing the, quote, right view to hold. Not teaching children to be Democrats or to be Republicans, just as you wouldn't teach them to be Christians or Jews or Muslims. Schools should teach the right behavior within a civic society, to obey all laws, to be active to bring about justice within existing law, and to engage change for more just laws, protecting and promoting the rights of each person, to analyze laws and practices to ensure all people may flourish. This is foundational in our Constitution. But schools should also be seen as employed by and supporting the role of parents in educated, educating and raising their children. This should mean, at a minimum, full transparency in the content of what is being taught. We should know what diversity, equity, and inclusion means at FM and what educational goals are associated with it before they are implemented. Do educators seek to teach not only that severe discrimination is a part of our country's past, but that many children today are participating in it by virtue of the color of their skin? Do educators wanna teach that the Republican platform on education and other policies is morally and politically wrong? If different people groups frequently experience different outcomes in education and life, does this mean is it, it is a result of discrimination 
And does it place blame on many of the children themselves? Have either of these claims been shown to be fact, or are they merely asserted, often by people with a specific political agenda? And do educators want to teach that LGBTQ people not only have rights, which they should have, I'm very supportive of that, but that their choices are morally good and should be praised? Recently, my son sprained his ankle. The FM nurse nurse offered to provide crutches, giving assistance so, that, assistance so that he could experience a similar outcome. I like this, and I would like it if other children receive assistance to overcome the stress of living with just one parent, or of being in a blended family, or of being limited by their physical or cultural background. Everyone should want every child to reach his or her highest potential. I ask the board to be a friend to parents. Tell us what diversity, equity, and inclusion mean to you and how it might be applied. Listen to how we think and feel. Work with us in helping teach our children well. Please leave it to us to raise our children according to our moral and political values. It is our right as parents. Is this unreasonable for us to ask for? Thank you. James Sharples. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for making the time for me today. My name is Jim Sharples. I uh, and my family have been in the FM area for about seven years. Uh, I've got my wife and I have three wonderful children, one who's graduated out of the FM public school system and two that are still in it. And we're very pleased, we're very happy with the vast majority of everything. So thank you on behalf of everyone. Well, on behalf of my family. Um, I'm here today to support the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. Um, when I got the email from Dr. Tice, I read through it, I looked at the resources, um, and I felt it was appropriate. Um, not because of a political point of view, I'm rather apolitical, um, more so from a personal point of view. I grew up not too far away from here in a relatively homogenous area and went to parochial school up until high school where there was barely anybody of color. And then when I went to high school, I played sports with a lot of people of color and was sort of culturally shocked by some of the tensions that were there that I was completely unaware of. Um, shortly after high school, I joined the Army and the infantry um, and served with a lot of incredible people from all around the country, a lot of cultural diversity and a lot of cultural shock for myself. But it was a great learning experience. But I think what we're trying to do here is give our children a chance to maybe not be so shocked and not have such a jarring experience when they get out into the real world um, and not maybe the homogenous world that we live in here. So I'm in full support. I really am very pleased with it. I'm also very pleased with the debate. I love the discussion that is happening because I think it's important to hear from all sides. So thank you very much for your time. Sarah Fitzgerald. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. I'm here as a member of this community and a mother of four children who are currently or will be soon in the FM community. I'd like to express my support to the board and to the administration for taking the issue of diversity, equity, inclusion under thoughtful reflection and consideration. I'd also like to thank you for acknowledging we can and we should do better in this area. And I believe it's a tremendous opportunity for our district to demonstrate real leadership. I feel strongly that all of our children will significantly benefit from diversity of viewpoints, experiences, and ideas. By increasing the exposure of our children to multiple perspectives and creating environments where they can have meaningful dialogue, discussions, and debates, we are creating, helping to create them into well-rounded, um, thoughtful, compassionate individuals capable of critical thought and empathy. And isn't that what we all want? 
I recognize that this, like so many other aspects of a child's development, is not the sole responsibility of the school and shouldn't be. But how the school chooses to actively work to create an environment where all of our children feel welcome, supported, and encouraged to do their best work together, together is critical. My children, who look like me, have never had to come into a classroom where they are the only ones who look like them. Nor have they ever had to wonder why none of their teachers do. I'm here to advocate for both my own children and for all of the children in our district, the ones that are here now and the ones that I hope will come in the future. I urge the board to continue to do the work to try to listen and understand how we can be better for all of those children. I am in full support of the actions outlined in Dr. Tice's recent email, and I stand ready as part of this community to do what I can to support the school district in its implementation of a more diverse, inclusive environment for all of our children. Thank you. I hope I don't mispronounce his last name as well. Amy Kraus. Cruz, I'm sorry, Cruz, pardon me. It's Cruz. It's okay. <laughs> oh. Hello, my name is Amy Cruz. I'm gonna take a breath. I'm a parent of two children in the FM school district and I'm an FM alum. I'm here tonight to express my support for the district's DEI initiatives because all students, all students, deserve to be in a safe, welcoming, and supportive school where they can learn and grow. As a straight, able-bodied and minded white woman, I lead a privileged life. No one tells me that I'm less than because of my skin color or sexual preference. No one treats me differently because of my physical and mental abilities. So I have a choice. I can benefit from the privileges that society has given me and be a complacent bystander while others have to fight for their basic human, human rights, or I can choose to be a true ally and lift people up. I choose the latter. As an FM grad who moved away after college, lived in a large city and then came back, I can tell you that the world is a big place that this school did not prepare me for. There's something to be said for living in a suburban bubble. It's comfortable and easy for many of us, but it's not the real world. We are doing a disservice to our kids by not teaching them lessons that will help them be compassionate humans. Because DEI is not a political issue. It is not a religious issue. It is a human issue. As a district that prides itself on excellence, I implore you to think beyond grades SAT scores and college acceptance rates, and to think about who these students are that we're sending out into the world. We need to treat students and staff with respect so they feel valued for exactly who they are, and then teach them how to demonstrate that respect to others. There may be uncomfortable moments, but life is full of uncomfortable moments. It's how we move through those moments that's important because on the other side is growth and broadening perspectives. So I ask you, what will make FM excellent in the future? Can we care about test scores and character development? Can we be known for nurturing hardworking and empathetic and compassionate leaders? There's a lot to be done in this district and I'm so thankful for the steps that you all are taking. Thank you so much for your time. Heather Waters. I was recording Amy there. Uh, my name is Heather Waters and I'm here tonight um, as a parent and as a graduate of FM K through 12, a parent of a current student. I'm here to support the DEI and A access initiatives that you're proposing and through Dr. Tice's message to the community. 
I'm also here to support the students and the recent grads who brought their action items and their concerns and their insistence on change. I will track that progress and support the efforts that we all make to see these changes happen. I want to acknowledge the commitment that you as leaders of the district have made to ensure that diversity, equity, inclusion, and access are demonstrated standards and values. And I want to ask you to do something else. Will you please update the 2023 strategic plan to include and refer to the district's DEI and A standards and actions? Will you please also engage, if you haven't already, the academic and curricular partnership that is available through the SCA NOAA Great Law of Peace Center at the elementary, middle, and high school levels? And please share your plan frequently with us about how you might find a way to recruit diverse teachers and administrators. Thank you so much. Dr. Abdul Malik. I'm really sorry if I mispronounced that, doctor. Good evening. I'm Dr. Ines Abdul Malik. In full disclosure, I'm a sociologist who also does DEI work. But today, I come to you from the perspective of my most important role as a parent of two FM school children and also to express my support for FMDI initiatives. For the past 14 years, my children have received a great education, which translated into admission and enrollment into the best colleges. My children have had wonderful teachers, but they never had a black teacher, not even a substitute teacher who was black, not at Matwood, not at Wellwood, not at the high school. This is why I support the EI initiatives as mandated by the state from which we are partially funded. What does DEI mean for people who look like me? First, diversity encompasses the demo demographic mix of particular groups of folks who have historically been marginalized and underrepresented in this country. Blacks, indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ folks, and those with different abilities. Diversity in the FM school district is the inclusion of those marginalized faces and voices, and also creating spaces for them. In a non-diverse community, we always feel like strangers. After 14 years of being in this district, one of the first questions I always get asked, particularly while I'm the only black face in, at the uh, sideline of the soccer field. Where are you from? Yes, I understand that my skin color and accent may yield those questions. And oftentimes, I welcome those conversations because they allow me to speak about the multiplicity of my identity and also the combination of travels and experiences in the multiple languages I speak. But at times, the tone suggests that I'm a visitor in these spaces. Put yourself in my place. How does it feel to always be a foreigner in your own home and to always have your belonging question in your own community. Do some white parents who oppose this initiative truly believe that an inclusive curriculum will be discriminatory towards them? Predominantly white teachers will start teaching about oppressing white folks. How does that work? Second, an equitable curriculum is about promoting justice which will broaden students' understanding of some underlying causes of racial inequalities that are pervasive in most American institutions, and not the sanitized versions that are often taught, and also should not be grounded in white supremacy or religious beliefs that are oftentimes exclusionary. 
Equity also ensures that all students receive the necessary support to perform at the highest level. So why not provide support for those who feel marginalized and for those who feel as though they do not belong? Third, as for inclusion, it's not just about having a diverse group if the processes that are in place are not conducive to full participation. I'm hoping while the district is implementing this cultural, culturally responsive education as mandated by the state, they are also reassessing and exploring ways to attract and retain teachers from underrepresented groups. DEI requires respectful, thoughtful, and purposeful engagement with students from diverse backgrounds. Thank you. Next on the agenda, item 4.01, past president's report. Me. Oh, well, thank you, Eleanor, for reminding me of that. Thank you, everyone, for coming um, to give your feedback to the board in regards to the diversity, equity, and inclusion work that we will be undertaking in our district. We appreciate everyone. I know it's summertime. People want to be out and about, but thank you for coming and lending your support and sharing your opinions in regards to this work. I would encourage all of you to please continue to follow the board meetings, hear what we're saying about it um, over the next year so they understand exactly what the district is going to be doing. Um, there is a culturally responsive sustaining education framework um, webpage that the state has available with information about the initiative. There's a lot of information out there, but I would encourage everyone, if you can't come in person again, all of our meetings are live streamed and they're recorded. Um, and you can also email the board. I, I know a number of you have <laughs> emailed the board and received responses. So please continue to do that. And thank you for coming this evening. to continue in our leadership positions, or greatly appreciate that. Um, I'll give everyone a moment who wants to leave. Okay. Should we turn off this mic? Sure, thank you, Heather. Yeah. I don't think I know how to turn it off. You got it. Can I just say one thing before you all go out the door? Just, just one thing. So I understand that people came for public comment and you had things that you wanted to tell us about DEI, but a lot of you talk about transparency and wanting to know what's happening in the schools. If you stay for the whole meeting or you watch the, re the whole meeting, you get a lot of that information. So I understand it's a beautiful July day and people wanna go out and spend time with their families. So if you can't stay for the whole meeting, please when you get home later on or whatever, please watch the entire meeting and actually and, and hear what we're talking about later on the agenda, okay? Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay, all right, looks like some folks state. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so I was on item 4.0, past president's report. Um, I will send out the, um, not the doodle, the um, form for everyone to put um, committee choices for the upcoming year. And I do have a suggestion in regards to committees. We've had the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee as an ad hoc committee of the board. And I would suggest that at least for the upcoming year that we make that an actual, or actually I would suggest that we make that a standing committee of the board um, and with a chair um, that reports um, regularly like other committees. Um, that's my recommendation to the board. I certainly want to hear what other people think about that idea. So I'll pause to get some feedback and discussion about that. Yep, I agree. I was going to make the same suggestion, so agreed. Uh, 
I would also be in support. Were you about to, uh, looks like you're about to hit the buzzer. Yeah, no, I, I support that. And I think then it's, it's just about making sure that we, when our committee reports out that we're, we're doing it on a regular basis mm -hmm. so that all the work is regularly communicated as it's a topic of interest. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're not jumping ahead of um, the state education department's culturally responsive sustaining. Mm -hmm. um, so um, to whatever extent we could make sure that we have informed discussions and uh, keep apprised of what the state's going to be requiring of us, then I'm in full support of it. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Okay, so at uh, Dan. So, yeah, so my, my only question, is, and again, to Mark's point of getting ahead of it was, and I was just trying to find it quickly and didn't, I'm not gonna find it quickly, quickly enough now, um, was that I, I thought that one of the recommendations from the state was the formation of a standing district DEI committee that was not just comprised of board members, but also parents, teachers, students. Um, so I, I'm, just, I'm just not sure how what you're proposing would play with, or I don't want to say against, but, but I, I think it might be getting ahead of it a little bit because that was the recommend, one of the many recommendations that I recalled um, coming from the state. You're correct. So the framework, um, culturally responsive staining framework, there is work that is to be done by the administrative staff, work to be done by the board, and work to be done by the community. So I definitely agree that we all need to um, unpack that and understand what we will be required to do. But I think it's helpful to have a committee um, that is going to be involved in DEI in general. So it's not getting ahead of it. I think it's a good start based on our previous board goals, but you are correct. There is the, um, that is a huge requirement of the framework that we include the community. So, and to that point, we have a tentative, uh, board meeting on July 7th, 19th. And I was hoping that we could use that as a board retreat so that we could get um, better educated about um, what is going to be required of us as a district related to the culturally responsive sustaining framework. So just understanding what that is, um, not making any decisions of course, but as we do with any initiative that comes to the district, I think we need to make sure that we are fully informed as board members about what it is going to entail. And perhaps I don't, um, what your timeline is, Dr. Tice, if that works with your timeline um, for discussions with cabinet, and maybe that could even be some sort of a joint retreat. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, certainly, I mean, I think uh, finding time, uh, at least for the board, to begin to explore that will be important. We're unpacking it just as everybody else is. So uh, you can never start too early, but at the same time, the guidance has just been released as well as the roadmap. So we're going to be working through it ourselves, starting with the convocation. So I think the 19th might be premature to get everybody together, but that doesn't preclude the Board of Ed to start to delve into some of the so, stuff. So, so my, my, my point was merely, so we, we have the ad hoc committee just before, I, I would just like to have an opportunity to unpack what the requirements, the recommendations and our course of action will be before we jump to permanent committee establishment. I, I would just suggest we had an ad hoc committee in the last year that we continue with that and maybe it's for a month maybe it's for three months maybe it's for six months but at I, I, I I'm, I'm expecting at some point there will be it will no longer be ad hoc I just don't think that that change should come before we have a chance to sit down and unpack that and then the only other thing I'll add to that is I won't be here on the 19th I don't want to tie the idea of a diversity equity and inclusion committee completely to this work because for me, I think that that's something that's going to be needed, that is needed and will always be needed. We will always need to have discussions about diversity and equity and inclusion. So I don't think it's premature. I think we may actually be behind the ball on getting some, on having a committee. 
um, a board committee that discussed that issue. We're not charging that committee to make any particular decisions at this time, but I think having that as a standing committee, um, continuing some of the work that it did as an ad hoc committee is very important um, work that we, we, that we need to do. Now you just said you wouldn't be here on the 19th. I think it's important that everybody be involved in a retreat. So that stops me right there from that date. And we will look to find a date when everyone can be involved. The other thing that we could do with that retreat is we did discuss the fact that um, our administrators had diversity training and there was some discussion about the board possibly having diversity training as well. And we've received um, emails from a number of very um, qualified individuals in our community who've offered to assist us with that. We have a partnership with um, the um, interreligious um, councils. There are a lot of folks out there who could do that sort of work with the board. So that could possibly be part of a retreat as well. Elena? Marissa, what would the downside be in leaving the committee as an ad hoc committee as we start the year till we get our footing? I mean, there's so many conversations we haven't even had yet. We can always change it, as Dan had said. And you had mentioned transparency, and I believe that the ad hoc committee has been very transparent with what it's done. I mean, honestly, we haven't, we didn't accomplish a lot of work because we were just trying to work through a lot of the things. Um, even with our reading and our retreat that we had had as well with Dr. Brown. So I, I just keep going back to, all right, we want to change it. We've, we've never said that this work is not important. We've always said that the work is important. So again, my initial question is, what would the uh, downside be of leaving it the way it is right now until we have a clearer direction? We haven't even met with administration yet. We're not saying the committee is going to take on any particular type of work. This is a committee like any other. So you're asking me about the downside of it. And I want to look at is what is the positive of it? We're saying as a board, we're committed to this work. What is the harm in having a DEI committee as a standing committee of the board? We are not making decisions. Um, we're not getting ahead of ourselves. There's a lot we can discuss as a committee. There's a lot that we can discuss as a board. But you're implying that having an ad hoc committee, that any work of an ad hoc committee is less important than work of a standing committee. That's simply not true. So again, my, you didn't answer my question. What is the downside of leaving it an ad hoc committee? And I'm going to respond to that by saying that it gives it more importance to make it a standing committee. And it's more of a commitment to make it a standing committee than to continue to have it as an ad hoc committee. I, I guess, I'm sorry, you, we, we, we had a discussion about committees at the beginning of last year. And Marissa, you were, you were very specific that your view on committees was that every committee should have a specific charter. So if you're proposing today a standing DEI committee, what, what is proposed as the charter? Because where we stand today is still very early in this process. We have a sample, I'll, I'll, it, from NISBA, they call it a sample policy. I think that we've all seen it and, and you know, know that it's a lot of background, a lot of history and some policy, um, but that's still being reviewed by the administrative team. And we haven't even had a chance to circle back from the administrative team on policy yet of what a proposed DEI policy for this district would would even yet look like. So I, I just think trying to put together a formal charge for a formal standing committee on DEI when, when we aren't even at yet the point of having received administrative feedback on a proposed DEI policy. I just I just think it's so I, I just I, I think we should be continuing as we are with it uh -huh. and continuing with the work, which is clearly important work. And and moving forward and it may evolve to where we're ready to have a standing committee with a specific charge. I just don't think we're there today. Can I, to can I interject point, a different, yeah, just a yeah, different just one quick point because he brought up the charges. I did mention that last year and there were objections to that and we didn't do it. We did not do that. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that was something that you were not in favor of at the time. So I'm, I'm a little perplexed as to why that's something that would stand in the way of having, just a second, Daniel, just a second, Dan. I'm, I'm a little perplexed as to why we wouldn't 
have a DEI committee because there's no standing charge. We have a lot the DEI committee can unpack. We still have the response to the information that was brought to us by the, the students groups that came. We can, we can look at that. We can look at um, other issues that have been brought um, to the board. Um, we've been told about issues of, you know, simple, I, I like to look at some of the low hanging fruit of things that we, we can easily accomplish or, or quickly get into, you know, simple things like forms and other things that we may not be thinking about, but that have been discussed in the district. So I think it's important that we commit to a DEI committee. No one's saying what's going to be the outcome of that committee, but we're saying the work is important. Rebecca. I, I think we're getting too hung up on the formality of ad hoc versus standing, and I don't think it matters. I mean, clearly this is an issue that is top of mind for our community and for our board, and then we will be setting goals, but we do anticipate that there will be, this will be a goal going into next year and beyond. Um, another way to look at this would be to talk about these issues as a full board and have a section of the agenda. Um, what I do think we need no matter what is a follow-up meeting for our, what was our ad hoc committee before we move forward to really put a, put a bow on what is the work we've done, what are recommended next steps, how do we want to connect with our administrators and taking a look at what's out there so far with the, um, the framework that's been published by the state so we at least can start to think about it, but clearly there's a lot more to come. But irrespective of what the state's put out, we've done our own work and I think we need to try to just kind of summarize from this calendar year or academic calendar year and move forward. So I propose that we... We tried to schedule a meeting prior to reorg. Let's get something on the calendar, and then we can talk a little bit about the finer points of standing versus ad hoc, but I don't think this is a good use of our time to keep debating it. I concur. I, I think we should move on. I would be very comfortable continuing as an ad hoc committee with the sense that at some point we're going to have to expand our committee to community, maybe staff people. So I think for the time being, it would be fine to keep it as it is. The people who are on that committee chose to be on the committee, so... I think it will be just fine, Marissa, really. And Marissa, you had mentioned looking at forms. That's not our job as a Board of Education. I absolutely believe that everything that goes home to our families should be sensitive for all families, but that's not our job to look at forms to see if they're correct. I mean, that's administrative work, building work, so district work, not board work. It's, it doesn't fall under board governance. So because that was mentioned, I just did want to clarify that in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure I'm correct, that it doesn't fall under the category of board work. We've never looked at forms that the buildings have given out to families as a board. Not in all my 23 years on the board, starting 24 years, we, that's not something we do. Don't miss the bigger picture for the um, way that I pointed out the issue. The bigger issue is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and issues that have been brought to the board that we need to look at. So to the point of let's not get into the weeds here, I would, make, I would just say that we stick to, we need to be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and not saying these individual things don't fall under our purview. We all know what's administrative and what's policy. I, right. did, yeah, I, so, I know we have to move on. I just want to uh, make sure we remember that although our usual uh, the way we usually run committees, are, they are board committees. We are not at all um, locked into doing it that way. We could have community members on these board committees, on these committees. Um, so if we want to be fully transparent, it might be something that we can look at or discuss in the future um, that we invite parents to be parts of, part of this committee, these committees. And to your point, that's part of the framework that there has to be committees that include parents um, involved in them. So that's an excellent point. Thank you, Sherry. Um, all right, so we'll keep it as a standing committee, but I do also think we should have it on the agenda for our future board meetings um, as a discussion item. We've kept it under board development, which I think it makes it hard for the public to know where it is coming up under the agenda. So I do think we should have it on the agenda somewhere. Um, more spelled out so people know that's what we're discussing. 
And then we'll just to follow up, will we send out a new doodle and try to get our send, ad hoc committee meeting this month? We will send month? out a new doodle. This will be the third one. So um, I think we're looking for the date we can get most people. We'll try a couple like two weeks, but I think we're looking for the date that we can get the majority of folks together, whether some people have to come via Zoom or whatever, and, and some in person. But since it's the third one, I really want to make sure we get a date. Um, so we will not have the meeting on the 19th because everyone's not available, but we should get another doodle out looking for another board retreat time. If I may, we may still need to do something on the 19th oh, okay. so people even if it's a small contingent. No, no, just for personnel. So if you know, we, we, usually if do we it hire that from outside, it right. would allow them to give their 30 days notice by, All right, but so it could be a, a short meeting. Could Thank be like you. the 8 a.m. five member meeting. Okay. I know right. they're all saying we were so close. We were but. so close. All right, so please keep that meeting on that time on your calendar. Um, let's see. Next on the agenda, item 4.02, superintendent's report, Dr. Tice. Thank you, President Mims. Uh, the report is in your and uh, board docs. Uh, under internal operations and as referenced in the most recent Thursday letter, I had an opportunity to speak at a recent Town of Manlius planning board meeting to remind them that the school district does not get to insert themselves into the process of solar farms until after deliberations occur at the town level. Unfortunately, some media Outlets prematurely suggested that the school district was supportive of such solar pro projects, even though it has not come before our Board of Education for our own discussions with respect to the opt-out provisions of real property tax law 487. So it was really just a point of clarification. Under community relations, I'd like to thank all of our retirees who were honored at a number of different events at the end of June, our collective service to the children of the Fayetteville Manlia Central School District was most appreciated and was special, and it was special to be able to visit with them and some of their family members at these events. So on behalf of a grateful community, we thank all our retirees for their commitment and dedication to all of our students during the course of their respective careers. Under administration, I'd like to offer a hearty thank you to the high school administration, the high school counselors, and high school faculty members for a wonderful graduation ceremony at St. Joseph's Health Amphitheater at Lakeview. The expeditious work of Dr. Ray Kilmer and our business office helped to ensure that our commencement exercises were be able to be held in this most appropriate outdoor venue. I know that many families were pleased as it allowed us to celebrate the work of our graduating seniors in style and hopefully in a small way helped to make up for all that they sacrificed individually over the course of the past 15 months. Under non-instructional business operations, our external audit will soon be underway to close out the books and balance sheets from the past school year. With the internal audit and the rearview mirror, thanks to the work of our audit committee, the external audit will begin in earnest over the summer months, thanks to the preparatory work of our business office staff. And as you know, they will report out uh, to the audit committee, the external auditors will, in anticipation of coming to the board in October. Under personnel, we are in the process of working with the Town of Manlius Police Department to fill the last two special patrol officer positions this summer. This will complete our incremental hiring initiative to bolster our security at each of the school buildings. As you know, we've done it over a series of years, and this will give us three CSIROs, school information resource officers, and four part-time retiree special patrol officers to ensure coverage for all six buildings on each of our four campuses. In the area of students, as the summer begins to unfold, I know it's important for our families to plan for the new school year. So to that end, I'd like to state as of now, we are planning for a future in which all students return to in-person instruction for five days a week in the autumn. While we expect some vestiges of the pandemic to remain, especially for our younger students who have yet to be vaccinated, we will continue to anxiously await any new executive orders or New York State Department of Health guidelines or State Ed Department guidance that might be forthcoming. In the area of instruction, with respect to the reopening of school in September, it will be important for our families to realize that in the event that the governor orders 
that remote instruction will continue into the new school year, that the remote learning model will be provided by OCM BOCES instructors. Uh, we owe them our estimates this week. Even though the past year was less than ideal for everyone involved, the school district was able to provide all of our electives in the hybrid, in-person, and remote learning models thanks to the hard work of our teachers. I suspect that that will not be the case in the autumn as OCM BOCES will be in charge of the remote learning platform while our faculty return to work with in-person students. And last but not least, under Capital Project, the Wellwood Middle School Capital Improvement Project is progressing nicely. We had a couple of meetings uh, today with the contractors as well as the OACM team, and a lot of work is going on in renovating the classrooms. It'll still keep the uh, traditional facade of the building, uh, but the classrooms inside are going to look modern and new. We anticipate that the first and third floors will be turned over to the school district in late August, early September. I know we're trying to schedule a board uh, tour of that facility in late August, and so that we'll be able to use that space while work on the second floor will continue through the autumn so that hopefully that will be turned over following the ho holiday break. In other news, our work at Enders Road, the carpet removal and the high school security upgrades is progressing. In addition, the energy performance contract is in the final closeout phase and the newly approved emergency uh, project uh, with repairs to the masonry at the gymnasium at Fayel will soon be underway for summer work. That concludes my report. Thank you. Questions for Dr. Tice? I wonder, Dr. Tice, I heard through the grapevine that there might be a problem with Wi-Fi in Wellwood. Are we working on that? That's, you haven't heard that. I have not heard that. You mean during the summer months? Do they no, disconnect something or? Within the new construction, it's not transmitting. Okay. No, I have not heard that. Right. We can check into it as I look at our assistant superintendent. That did not come up in today's meetings at all. Any additional questions for Dr. Tice? Okay, next item 4.03, committee and representative updates. Let's see, I do not believe that one for audit, correct, Daryl? Dr. Tice covered a lot of it, but uh, just to reiterate, we had a meeting on the 16th of June, as you've probably read, with both our internal and external auditors. Um, the external auditors gave us the, the timeline for the next audit, and Jim Buffum from EFPR uh, gave us another wonderful report. So I guess I would only like to publicly thank our, our business office, Mr. Furlong, Ms. Fry, Ms. Conley, the whole group, I know they've worked very hard. And both auditors always say it, that they do so much work ahead of time that it makes their job easier. So thank you very much. Any questions for Daryl? I, right. I don't know if it's so much to Daryl or Dr. Tice, what's the plan for filling the deputy auditor spot? Um, my guess, Dan, is that when we meet again, we'll discuss it. We haven't always had one, but we did have one who just resigned, so, right? So we'll take it up in our next meeting. Thank you. All right, community relations has not had a recent meeting. Uh, facilities, Dan, do you have anything you wanna add? No. Nope. Um, finance met on June 11th, is there anything new? Okay. Policy met on the 24th, Elena? Um, yeah, we had a um, not too much, too long of a meeting. However, we continued our work on the 1000 series. Um, we went through 1500, 1511, and 1530, asked for some revisions and asked some questions. Um, and then we just discussed the policy review process moving forward and what it was that we felt that we needed as we were looking at policies. And that's it. The work will be continued. It will be picked up from the current, from this year's committee 
excuse me, from where last year's committee left off. Sherry, is there an FM Education Foundation update? They did have their reorg meeting, um, and we just want to thank Tracy Romano and Lily Loke for their leadership roles over the past few years because they'll be stepping down, and now we have new members in their positions. So that's the basic update. Thank you. Uh, nothing for legislative liaisons, correct? And, well, are we, we are in need of a student board member. Are we going to find out in the fall, or is that something that we... Yeah, typically we uh, hear from Dr. Kilmer in the fall. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda, item 5.01, appointments. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manlius School District make the following appointments as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. Is there a second? Thank you, Rebecca. Any discussion of the appointments? just had one question and it was on um, just for clarification on the construction manager so it, it's listed as the chase which obviously is correct and, and they're doing great work on the high school project um, but it's listed just in what's before us as for all other projects and I just I didn't remember that being what that appointment was this one here is for the pre-referendum and at that time it, we've talked about multiple buildings we've talked about a single building and we're in the process of bringing that forward so that can be for proposed projects that is that what you're saying you want to I, I just wasn't sure what we this, just left it i just wasn't oh. sure what the just the way it was it, it's in parentheses here for all other projects i just wasn't sure what the scope of that meant I didn't want to be presumptuous and define what the board has enacted upon for a potential vote in the future. That's all. Okay, so it's for all other projects related to what this current pre route work is, is for the place. yes, whatever the vote may be. It's not in to perpetuity. Okay, yes. that's that's all I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next item 5.02, designations. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District make the following designations as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Rebecca. Second from Kelly. Discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 5.03, authorizations. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manlea School District make the following authorizations as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Mark. And a second from Daryl. Discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Uh, new business, item 6.01, approval of the minutes from the June 14th, 2021 meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Rebecca. Second from Sherry. Discussion of the minutes? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 6.02, personnel actions. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District approve the following personal actions as recommended by the superintendent? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Mark. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? <clears throat> Item 6.03, Health and Welfare Services Contract with East Syracuse Manoa Central School District. Oops. Is there a motion that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorize the board president, district clerk, and superintendent to sign the contract for health and welfare services provided by the East Syracuse Manoa Central School District for the 2020-21 school year? Thank you, Rebecca. And a second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 6.04. Health and Welfare Services Contract, City School District of Albany. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorize the Board President, District Clerk, and Superintendent to sign the contract for Health and Welfare Services provided by City School District of Albany for the 2020-21 school year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Rebecca. Second from Sherry. Discussion? 
All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 6.05, policy in first reading. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby move the revised policy 3220 into second reading at the next possible board meeting? This is the therapy dog policy. Thank you, Kelly. Second from Dan. Any discussion? Not discussion. I apologize. I left this out of my review of the board agenda until today and then realized otherwise I would have sent this in an email, but I just saw that there's a few gender pronouns that might need to be fixed in this policy. Um, so prior to the next meeting, can um, we can probably go through that and pull it, out the just gender pronouns. Them. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. I can point that out to an email if it's easy. Thank you very much. And thank you for your su original suggestion that we remove those. All right, so we had a first and a second, some discussion, any, any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and keep aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, item 6.06, .06, approval of a consulting agreement. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fable Manly Central School District hereby authorizes the superintendent to execute an agreement with Lisa Deneen for consulting services during the 2021-22 school year in an amount not to exceed $20,000. Is there a motion? Thank you, Sherry, and a second from Mark. Discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 6.0. <clears throat> 07, acknowledgement of the internal audit report. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby acknowledges receipt of the internal audit report for 2020-21 and that the report indicates no findings that require a corrective action plan? Is there a motion? Thank you, Jason. Is there a second? Thank you, Sherry. Any discussion? I, I just have a technical question. I didn't look at this in detail until this afternoon. The first page of this calls it a control cycle audit. The motion is to approve the audit. But in the first page of the report, it says we were not engaged to and did not conduct an audit. So what is this? Marissa, can I take a crack at this? Yes, Jason, you may. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. I mean, I could. So it's the accountant legalese way of saying you can't sue us because we looked at your internal controls. Right. That's more or less what it is. Um, no. So what they did is they did a review of our controls. Um, they don't offer an opinion on it one way or the other, but they tell you in their report, in their legal way, that basically our internal controls are functioning as intended and there aren't any issues. It is. And as every year, we, we charge them to look at something. And for this year, it was the payroll. So they took a sampling of payrolls and checked to make sure everything balanced and was, was even. So I think Jason, cover it, Bill. <laughs> the semantics thing of just, let's just be clear about what it is, that it's a review of internal controls and not an audit because they specifically say it's not an audit. So that was, that's my only point. They paid a lawyer a lot of money, Dan, to write it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. I had a first Thank you, a, Jason. I had a first and a second and some discussion. Thank you for your expertise, Jason. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Next on the agenda, item 7.01, board development. We've kind of talked about a little bit of this under the president's report. So I will get the committee um, selection list out. We'll get a doodle for the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And um, we're still looking for a date for, well, we didn't decide, I don't think, whether or not we want to do diversity training. Are we committed to doing the diversity training? Is that, I want to make sure everybody's on board. To, I don't know a date yet, but we can start looking into that, okay. And then the annual convention, hopefully, will be October 24th through 26th in New York City. And I hope everyone's noted that the following year it will finally be returning to Syracuse, yeah. so. Um, last year we made a commitment as a board that we would um, stay home and you know 
save save money? Are we in the position now that we can attend conferences in person? Can we afford this, Dr. Tice? Yes, we can. It's always a very good conference to attend. Oh, um, I always you know, love it. I just want no, to be it's a good responsible. Point, we did, and I think the administrators and, and everyone was uh, didn't attend conferences next, last year yeah. because of um, we were being very frugal. So now our teachers, just to be equal on all levels, our teachers and uh, administrators free to attend conferences now? We're assuming we're going to ramp up, you know, barring any... Excellent. Forthcoming restrictions. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. Word. Can I just make a quick suggestion? Or I think we've talked about this before, but it, for those who end up attending, it'd be great to have an idea of maybe the workshops that everyone signed up for to make sure that may, we're maybe covering a broad cross section of what's being offered. That'd be great. Good Thank idea. you for that reminder. Just the only other question on that, since it's coming is, is I just don't remember the time frame on the resolutions review. I know some years we've run up against like a very tight timeline of it's past the deadline to submit any and but not to discuss oh, the some. resolutions. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that that's on somebody's radar of, of if we were to have one of when it would need to be submitted by and just 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 can we just get that on the you calendar? Have anything yet? I don't think so, but I can't. Yeah, I don't think I have either. Um, we can't. We'll look into it. Yeah. Okay. Usually, it is by the end of July or something. I, do. I thought I saw it was the sixteenth. So it should be sometime July sixteenth. I thought I just read that in an email. What's that? You could be right. July sixteenth. July sixteenth is yeah. correct. Um, just another thing that I saw in some of the NISPA communications that um, meeting that uh, it will be all virtual this year. It will not be at the convention, the business meeting, yes. So if it's the 16th, where? July 16th is the deadline for submitting proposed resolutions or bylaw amendments. The proposed bylaw amendments and resolutions book will be released on August 30th this year. So do we have anything, anything that we as a board would like to submit to the state, to NISBA? Do we have a resubmit the same resolution? Well, or the use the resolutions or the, the proposed resolutions are submitted to NISBA and they go to the resolutions committee that meets right. and right. the resolutions committee decides to endorse them or not. And then um, the resolutions go to the business meeting for the entire state to vote on. Right. I remember that. But our resolution yeah. to change the polling place. Um, it did pass. It passed, I think they stay. I think they stay as a position for either three years or five years. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. um, so they will keep it, but we may have to re-up it. We'll have to look. Rebecca, we can look into that. Dan, did you have a suggestion or a thought about a potential resolution? I, I, I didn't. I just didn't know what the timeline was, and was hoping we wouldn't be up against a deadline that we're up, apparently up against. So well, okay. and. It, as you know, it just came out yesterday, which is what everybody's referencing. So it was NISBA's update on July 5th, right? Oh, okay. So I guess my, my question, I'll turn that back from you to me, for me to Dr. Tice. Is there anything that the administrative team has identified that we should be seeking some change or modification to? Other than the polling place that we've talked about, we'd like to get out from under that. But okay. Um, item seven point oh two. I'm seeing nothing on the working agenda items. Seven point oh three. Potential considerations for future meetings. Um, future meetings calendar. Eight point oh one. Sorry. I had a question about future meetings. Well, maybe it's answered in the calendar. Well then. Yeah, the curriculum reports. I was just curious if they were returning and in what capacity. And we will, it looks like the next few meetings will be in this auditorium. Correct. All right, so Thank the next you, Sarah. meeting is the 9th and that will be the district safety plan hearing, capital project update and tax rates. 
I, I did email that I cannot attend that one. Um, have we worked out a way that I could attend that remotely? Um, or, I mean, I, I'm okay with just audio. If you wanted to vote, we would have to have you video conference from a location that's noticed publicly where the public can join you at your location. If you wanted to join by phone, you're welcome. We can arrange that. You would not be able to vote if okay. we arrange by phone. So you and I can talk offline about the details. Talk to you about how convenient that, inconvenient that might be. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, dates to remember. Finally, we've got one. September 2nd, opening day. All right. Jason, for your benefit, that's the... Um, Day when all the staff come together in the auditorium and um, Dr. Tice delivers a welcoming message to everyone. So that's a very nice day and hopefully everyone will be able to be together in the auditorium <laughs> to, to do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's good that we have a date even for it. So September 2nd, it's usually first thing in the morning. And if we're lucky, we'll get a performance by, um, it's usually the orchestra or the band or something. They, they do a performance for us, which is really, really nice as well. So it's usually like um, between like eight and nine or something like that. It's very brief, but it's first thing in the morning. All right. Consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Thank you, Dan. A second from Jace. I'm sorry, from um, Mark. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right. So we're on item 11, proposed executive session. So we have... Two items to go into executive session four. One is a superintendent's year end evaluation, and the other one, how are we phrasing that, Dr. Tice? I don't have my personnel. Per, uh, personnel about a specific person. Uh, personnel matter related to an individual person. All right, so we have two matters for, um, for executive session. Is there a motion to adjourn to executive session? Thank you, Kelly. And a second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right. So this is going to conclude the public session. Thank you all for hanging out for the rest of the meeting and staying. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you all for coming. All right. So the board will now.